OK, so uh, as you've probably been realizing, camouflaging is probably one of my focused interests or my special interests. Uh, so I'm going to come back and uh, tell you a little bit more about the work we've been doing. Because my contention is that camouflaging is a really, really important part of many autistic people's day-to-day -day lives and experience. I think in particular, it's an important part of the lives and experiences of autistic girls and women. So if we want to understand um, how we can help autistic girls and women, we need to know more uh, about camouflaging. So uh, as I said, camouflaging we define as masking, compensation, uh, putting on my best normal. Um, and again, I've got another of these pairs of clips, these kind of longitudinal clips uh, from somebody who we'll call HM when they first came to the clinic age 15 um, uh, and then very kindly uh, agreed to come back and talk with us and to help us use these videos for, for sort of training uh, purposes. Uh, and so, um, again, you'll, you'll quickly see this is a very articulate and thoughtful person, but I think the reason I'm playing their clips now is that they convey a lot about camouflaging in particular, but also other elements of, of the kind of experience of being autistic and, and female. So this is HM, interviewed by one of my uh, friends and colleagues, Mariana Murin, uh, age 15, um, and then we're going to meet them again uh, a little bit later. Okay, so there she is at 15. Now, um, five years later, HM now identifies us as Felix um, and is going to talk to us. Um, he's going to offer us uh, his insights further on the sort of um, the position, I suppose, of, of females uh, on the autism spectrum, including on camouflaging.
Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to go on now to, to kind of actually, I'm going to end up expanding on, on that. Actually, that was a very rich bit of sort of text. I thought there's a lot in there. Uh, but I'm going to expand on that a bit by talking about this study. It was done by, by my PhD student, uh, student Laura Hull and, and various other people, um, which, as I've said already, was called Putting on My Best Normal. So this was a study with 92 uh, autistic adults who completed a gay text into a, a web survey, and we did a qualitative analysis of those data using thematic analysis. And we were interested in the nature of camouflaging, which I'm not going to talk about much here because I've already talked about that, but the causes and the consequences of camouflaging. Um, so Laura eventually came up with, with this fairly elaborate uh, thematic framework. And again, the paper's open access, so I do recommend um, sort of downloading it and, and having a look at it. But let's have a think. So this part of the thematic map concerns motivations for camouflaging. This is the kind of why part of the analysis. Why do people uh, camouflage? Uh, and in particular, there were two kind of overarching themes. One we ended up calling assimilation. Um, so there's something about the need to fit in, I suppose. Often, as I'll say in a minute, an enforced need to fit in, an externally enforced need to fit in. And then the other one um, was called, again, based on, on, on the actual text of one person's quotation, to know and be known, to form relationships, to bridge between people, to, uh, to relate. Uh, so here are some quotes that, that relate to those themes, and I think they're quite powerful. Um, why do people camouflage? Camouflaging helps to survive in school and college, and it's important for keeping jobs, says this woman, this 27-year-old woman. And I think this is the one that really hit me between the eyes. Uh, why do you camouflage? I want to avoid the bullying, mostly. You know, I think it's very, very striking. You know, if we were doing a study of, for example, why in a certain country do um, gay men in certain situations pretend not to be gay, there would be no question that you would just say, well, this is about discrimination, this is about victimization, uh, and this is, shouldn't be expected of them. So you know, I do think there's a very interesting political element to this here, uh, which is you know, the, the people in the study, are, some of them are telling us that essentially camouflaging is something that's enforced upon them uh, by the, the very difficult experiences of being autistic in a world that's predominantly neurotypical and the kind of victimization and bullying that sometimes results for that. So um, no, I think it's that, I found that very striking, that quote. Uh, it's not entirely a kind of negative story, if you like. So other people felt more, if you like, more positive motivations for camouflaging. So it enables me to be with other people in a way that's relatively comfortable for me and for them. So there is something about, you know, as I said before, kind of bridging. So what about the consequences of camouflaging? What did people tell us about the effect that camouflaging had on them? Well, one idea was that actually by camouflaging, some autistic people felt that they, they almost, because they were camouflaging and weren't presenting regularly as their kind of authentic autistic selves, they were therefore not challenging simplistic stereotypes about what autism is. Um, so that was what perceived to be one sort of negative consequence of camouflaging. The main one, I think, was one that was, again, we, we've used the, the language of, of our, one of our participants here, was a theme called I Fall to Pieces. Uh, this sense about the anxiety and the exhaustion that can be associated with camouflaging. And then there was another um, theme, I'm not my true self. This notion that if you spend a lot of time pretending to be quite different to who you really are, that that can have undermining effects upon your um, identity. So again, some quotes to, to um, sum this up. I mean, so this is somebody who described themselves as, as other <laughs> gender, so they, they weren't, didn't identify as male or female, a 30-year-old. It's exhausting. I feel the need to seek solitude so I can be myself and not have to think about how I'm perceived by others. And that's certainly a very common um, experience that, that I hear about with, with camouflaging. Um, We've talked about this already, the way it can get in the way of, of being diagnosed with autism. Interestingly, one person, uh, in fact, more than one person, so this 28-year-old this woman said, people need to learn how to drop the camouflage when in situations such as medical assessments or dealing with support professionals. So there was an idea that it cut people off from getting support and could even interfere with kind of care that isn't just about autism. You know, so if people are always sort of determined, they feel obliged to put on this kind of front and that everything's fine, um, that can get in the way of, of open communication with physicians and so on. And then I thought this was a very 
uh, sort of poetic, really, expression of that whole kind of identity issue, I feel as though I've lost track of who I really am and that my actual self is floating somewhere above me like a balloon. So really, from this study, and it's just a qualitative study, so it's, you know, qualitative studies aren't there to test hypotheses or to say, you know, is this variable associated with that variable? You know, is, is, is amount of camouflaging associated with quality of life? They can't do that. That's not what they're designed for. What they can do is kind of map the terrain and, and generate ideas. So, I mean, but my sense from this, and an idea I'd like to test out, is that actually, for many people, not for everybody, of course, but for many people, Actually, the consequences of camouflaging, whereas the causes of camouflaging seem to be quite mixed and include some sort of more, in quotes, positive motivations as well as some really quite pernicious ones, like the avoiding bullying, in terms of the consequences, we had quite a lot of kind of negative comments, really, on, on the consequences of camouflaging. Um, and that certainly seems to me something that we need to investigate, building on this qualitative work, using a more quantitative framework, where you really can you know, test hypotheses or ask questions like, do people who camouflage more tend to report you know, higher social anxiety or, or, or lower quality of life, or, and so on? Um, but of course, to do those studies, you need to be able to measure camouflaging. And so that's what we've set about trying to do. Uh, we've developed a measure of camouflaging, uh, which after many hours of deliberation, we called the CAT-Q, um, uh, Camouflaging of Autistic Traits Questionnaire. Although I'm quite given the, co the conversation about cats we had earlier. I'm feeling that's quite uh, serendipitous. Um, so this is a self-report measure. It, it, it's based upon not the previous approaches I mentioned where you try and work out discrepancies between someone's how autistic they are and, their, and how they present in certain situations. This is about um, just asking people, based on our quite careful mapping of camouflaging in our qualitative work, um, questions about uh, whether they use certain behaviours, whether they attempt to camouflage, to mask, to compensate, and, uh, and so on. Um, it has 25 items. Uh, and again, you know, I, I need to give a sort of, uh, you need to treat these findings with appropriate caution because this is a paper that's currently under review. So it hasn't received the kind of stamp of being of a passing peer review and being published. So these are provisional findings I'm talking about here. Um, but we've recruited on the internet 350 autistic participants, of whom 191 are female, 471 non-autistic participants, and we've given them the questionnaire and done various things to try and work out whether the questionnaire is very good, uh, any good from their data. So the questionnaire measures overall camouflaging, but it has three subscales. Uh, compensation, I've talked about that already. Masking, I've talked about that. From our factor analysis, we came out with a third element of camouflaging that which we weren't particularly expecting, and which after, again, some, some head scratching, we called assimilation. So to give you a sense of what these scales measure, so compensation, one of the compensation questions is, um, I've spent time learning social skills from television shows and films and try to use these in interactions. Yeah? That would be a, that's one of the questions in, on the compensation scale. The masking scale, an example question is, I monitor my body language and facial expressions so that I appear interested by the person I'm interacting with. And then the assimilation scale is kind of about people kind of almost having to force themselves to, uh, to socially interact and to appear sort of socially engaged when they don't actually always feel like it. So I have to force myself to interact with people when I'm in social situations. And our initial findings are that um, the instrument possesses what we call reliability, so scores on it are fairly consistent over time, which implies that there's not lots and lots of error kind of washing around causing people's scores uh, to fluctuate. And some initial um, sorry, evidence for validity, i.e. this notion of does it measure what it says it's measuring. Uh, well, firstly, it was based you know, on, this, on this qualitative analysis, so it quite carefully maps onto um, the, the construct. But we also found, which I think would be consistent with what we'd expect from a, a, a true measure of camouflaging, that it's associated certainly with being autistic. You know, so autistic people report higher levels of camouflaging than non-autistic people. But even amongst those of autism, those with higher or self-reported autistic traits tended to report uh, more camouflaging. And um, again, I think supportive of the validity of this measure is that uh, females score higher than males on it, and that includes within the autism group. And that's a, you can see from this graph, so the green bars, so higher scores, so literally higher up scores indicate more camouflaging. 
that this side of the graph, the green bars, are, depicts the female scores on the measure. Uh, the blue bars depict the male scores on the measure. Uh, so the average score for females was higher. Um, it's kind of medium effect size. Uh, but I suppose the other thing you can see is that there's still quite a lot of overlap. You know, so whilst definitely camouflaging, social camouflaging, based on this finding, but based on other findings, is a key part of the female autism phenotype, I think we should just remind ourselves that lots and lots of autistic males do it too. Uh, I suppose this goes back to my point right about the beginning about not wanting to make too much generalizations, and that actually a lot of what we learn about camouflaging for females will be relevant to some males um, as well. Now, with this instrument, we're planning to go on and discover more about uh, the consequences of camouflaging. And we're currently doing a study where we're interested in, for example, the extent to which camouflaging maps onto people attaining certain academic and occupational goals that they set themselves, or the prediction that, that it should promote that. But what's intriguing, and again, these are rather initial analyses, but I thought I'd share them with you in the interest of letting you know kind of what we're up to and, and where the field might be going in the next year or two, it was interesting to note that even when we controlled for autism trait severity in the autism group, um, higher camouflaging scores are essentially associated with higher self-reported depression and higher anxiety and social anxiety. So again, I'd be very interested, I mean, uh, this is clearly, you know, it's, it's, it's unclear quite how these relationships work, but when we're asking this overall question, you know, is camouflaging good or bad? You know, when, when a young girl receives an autism diagnosis, should we be uh, encouraging her to camouflage? Or should we be discouraging her to camouflage? Or should we encourage her to find aspects of camouflaging that she finds useful and others that she doesn't? I think we need to learn more about uh, the, the, the sort of consequences of, of camouflaging. And I'd, look, I'd love to hear from, from, um, from, well, from everyone, but particularly from autistic people in the audience on, on that matter.